It was 2018. Alicia McPhail was just six years old. Alicia had been enjoying a vacation at her grandparents' house when someone snuck into the family's home late at night while everyone was asleep. The intruder, a popular YouTuber named Aaron Campbell, cautiously creeped into the girl's bedroom, kidnapped her, then took her to an abandoned hotel where he raped her, then murdered her. Worse yet, the crime wasn't even premeditated. Aaron simply said that he did it because he had an opportunity and, quite honestly, he did it because he wanted to. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Ty Knotts. Here on True Crime Stories, I do my best to cover crime cases you've never heard of and share the stories of some of the world's most disturbing serial killers. But more importantly, it's my goal to share the stories of the victims and their families and their search for closure after being subjected to some of the most heinous crimes imaginable. So if you'd like to support my work here on True Crime Stories, all I ask is that you hit the like button and subscribe. It's totally free and helps spread awareness of these cases. But with that, let's get started. Today's murder documentary is not one that you'll want to miss. The story begins on the Isle of Bute, an island in Scotland. The Isle of Bute is a very small island with an even smaller community of around 6,500 people. In the last decade, over 10% of the island's citizens have moved away for better opportunities, but it's a very tight-knit community of citizens who have, for the most part, lived their entire lives here. The history of the area dates back thousands of years, and we know that people must have been living here since at least 2000 BC, but it's possible they lived here much longer than that. All this to say, it's a beautiful area, and certainly not a place where you'd expect one of Scotland's most chilling and tragic murders to take place. A crime so disturbing that it changed the atmosphere of the entire island. Aaron Campbell was, by some people's definitions, a typical teenage boy. But if you ask me, Aaron had been showing signs of concerning behavior since he was very young, according to several articles that detail his early childhood. Aaron was born in England in 2002. He only lived in England for about four years before his family decided to move to the Isle of Bute. He moved here with his father, Christopher, his mother, Jeanette, and his younger sister. Aaron's childhood was filled with troublesome behavior. Contrary to what many news outlets would lead you to believe, Aaron was deeply disturbed. Headlines that outline his future crimes would describe him as average, clean cut, popular, and an unlikely culprit. But if we're being honest, the signs were there all along. It's just that they were largely ignored. Aaron was anything but an unlikely culprit. And just like the world's most deadly serial killers like Jeffrey Dahmer, Ted Bundy, and the like, Aaron had shown signs of early mental illness from a very young age. Worse yet, we know that Aaron was abused in various ways by his parents, but his mother was particularly damaging. Aaron has revealed that his parents would often beat him, put him down, and start fights over the smallest things. His mother was also a raging alcoholic on top of this, so it makes sense that Aaron had serious struggles as a child that followed him into his teenage years. We don't know specifically why, but at an early age, Aaron's mother had him tested for mental illness and learned that he most likely had issues with ADHD. Now, this isn't a label that I personally like to throw around because it's one of the most overdiagnosed conditions in the world. If a kid has issues sitting still for more than five minutes, they're immediately labeled as ADHD. But the truth is, they're kids. They're not meant to be sitting still. They're meant to be out playing and learning and doing hands-on activities. They're not meant to be sitting perfectly still and quiet every time it's convenient for an adult and told that they have a mental illness if they'd rather not participate in those activities. Though, my little rant aside, it does appear that Aaron certainly struggled with some sort of mental issues because his bad behavior would follow him all throughout his teenage years, and it seems as though he was purposefully trying to get into trouble. Maybe this was so his parents would notice him. Maybe it was because he hung out with the wrong crowd. We just don't know. What we do know is that Aaron's more violent activities began when he was very young. According to his friends and family, Aaron had developed a strange behavior of, get this, skinning cats when he was a child. 
Now, you'll notice me make several comparisons to Jeffrey Dahmer throughout this video because Aaron was, by all means, eerily similar to Jeffrey Dahmer in terms of his habits and his behaviors. Dahmer was also known to have skinned small animals, often with the help of his father, though his father obviously didn't know that this would have awakened an evil killer. Aaron Campbell was very much the same. He skinned cats and small animals for fun, and I'm just hoping that they were already dead when he found them. One newspaper article also details so-called voodoo rituals that Aaron also took part in, but the article didn't elaborate on what this meant specifically. Outside of this, as Aaron grew a bit older, his interests in entertainment also took a dark turn. His peers say that he was always obsessed with very dark videos, some of which were remarkably violent. One of Aaron's most chilling experiences as a child was one that he created for himself and a little girl who was out swimming one day. The circumstances surrounding this situation aren't well documented, but the young girl and Aaron were apparently swimming in the same area one afternoon. For reasons unknown, one thing led to another and Aaron began to hold the girl's head underwater. But he didn't do this in the typical way that kids do. This wasn't a quick five second dunk. He kept her there for such a long period that it's a miracle that she didn't drown or have lasting brain damage afterward. He was caught, but it doesn't appear that he was punished in any real way for this. He was let off the hook with little more than a slap on the wrist. To top this off, he also had a keen interest in violent video games. Now, I'm not one to jump on the bandwagon of saying that video games can make children violent. The evidence simply isn't there, but considering the underlying issues that Aaron was dealing with, it does seem reasonable to assume that these video games likely served as an outlet for him, maybe even keeping him away from committing such heinous acts at an even younger age. Or admittedly, they may have also opened his eyes to a whole new world of possibilities he wouldn't have imagined otherwise. Outside of his obvious behavioral struggles, Aaron Campbell also had to deal with serious bouts of depression, and I'm not talking about typical teenage struggles of wondering who you are, who you want to be, and feeling like no one else fully understands you. Aside from these pre-existing thoughts, Aaron struggled with clinical depression that he doesn't seem to have received any treatment for. Most of his depressive thoughts and actions wouldn't come out until years later when he revealed that he'd actively participated in self-harm and even gotten involved with drugs. When he was in his early years, Aaron attended Rothsay Academy with his friends. Rothsay is a small school on the Isle of Butte, and it's home to about 280 students each year. Aaron was known for being one of the popular kids, but it seems that most of his peers latched onto him for his unusual personality. For example, while many of the kids were making inappropriate jokes or playing sports with their friends, Aaron was a much more internal person. His wit and dark sense of humor is what kept his friends around, so he leaned into this behavior and lifestyle quite heavily. He was in great shape for his age and was quite active, but by the time he turned 15 or 16, his life choices took a serious nosedive. Aaron began to frequently engage in underage drinking with his friends. Now, the legal drinking age for children in Scotland is 16, so long as they order alcohol with a meal, but it seems that Aaron was involved in parties and binge drinking long before this. As he began to mature, Aaron revealed to his friends that he wanted to become a popular YouTuber. He hadn't done too much to make this career a reality, but he had begun to upload videos and some of them apparently gained a little bit of traction. But his aspirations of becoming an internet celebrity were cut short in 2017, when Aaron's dangerous lifestyle finally caught up with him. Aaron had begun to post alarming messages to Facebook, with Aaron claiming that he wanted to do something, quote, excessive, with the context of this statement suggesting that he may have considered f***ing someone. He also made a post that said, quote, might kill one day for the lifetime experience. Shortly after he made these posts, he was arrested and placed into a teen rehabilitation program after he was caught setting fires in the local area that threatened to burn down multiple homes and businesses. Aaron Campbell's career of crime had officially begun. Alicia McPhail was a beautiful six-year-old girl. She was being raised just outside of Glasgow by her mother. Unfortunately, the relationship between her mother and father didn't work out long term. 
When Alicia was just three months old, her parents separated and began to share joint custody of young Alicia. But Alicia wasn't bothered by this one bit. She was a very happy little girl who felt like she had the world in the palm of her hand. In every photo that I've ever come across, she always has a big smile on her face, with her teachers saying that she loved being at school and spending time with her friends. She loved reading and writing, but was particularly interested in writing. Outside of school, she could be found at the local gymnastics club or baking cakes with her mother. When she wasn't with her mother, she would spend every other weekend with her father and grandparents on the Isle of Butte. This is where she happened to be in July of 2018, when Alicia's family would become caught up in a living nightmare that would never end. It was July 1st, 2018. Alicia McPhail had been spending a few days with her father and grandparents during the summer break. Her grandparents lived in a modest home just on the edge of the ocean with a beautiful view that detailed everything that the Isle of Butte had to offer. Alicia had been placed in the room later that evening, and her grandparents turned on a Peppa Pig DVD for her to fall asleep to. Alicia's father, Robert McPhail, had been dating a woman named Tony McLaughlin. At around 11 p.m., Tony checked in on Alicia and found that she was safe and sound, fast asleep in her bed. According to the family, they all went to bed around this time, simply turning off the lights of the home and turning in for the evening. No one even bothered locking or latching the front door because in their community, everyone respected each other and crime almost literally never took place. But on this same evening, 16-year-old Aaron Campbell had been hosting a party at his home for around 15 of his friends. It didn't take Aaron too long to become far too drunk to regularly function. On top of this, his mother had been arguing with him all throughout the evening, essentially ruining his party and his mood. One of his friends said that they were worried about Aaron because he'd become suicidal and threatened to take his own life after his mother continued to argue with him. At about 12.30 a.m., the friend offered to spend the night with Aaron, but he refused. Instead, he said he was going to head out and buy drugs from a local dealer. As it would turn out, that dealer was none other than Robert McPhail, Alicia McPhail's father. According to Aaron, he'd been in a close relationship with Robert and his girlfriend, Tony, for quite some time. In fact, Aaron even claims to have had an intimate relationship with Tony around this same time, but Tony has denied these claims entirely, with a judge labeling the claims as a travesty of the truth. Either way, on this particular evening, Robert was not answering his phone, likely because it was 1.30 in the morning at this point. When Robert didn't answer, Aaron began to call Tony multiple times, but she obviously didn't answer either. This is where Aaron initiated the beginning stages of what would be one of the most heartless crimes that the Isle of Butte had ever seen. Since Robert and Tony weren't answering their phones, Aaron concocted a plan to steal the drugs. He left his home at 1.54 a.m. armed with a kitchen knife. Roughly five minutes after leaving his home, Aaron Campbell arrived at the home of Robert and Tony. He entered the home through the unlocked front door, clutching his kitchen knife tightly. As he worked his way through the home, he came across Alicia's bedroom, which was located just past the entrance of the home. As he passed by her room, Aaron Campbell would later admit that he saw a moment of opportunity, claiming that all he thought about from the moment that he saw her was how easy it would be to kill her. What happened next is a detail I wish we could skip over, but Aaron lifted Alicia from her bed and left the home with her in his arms. He took her to the beach that was just a minute or two from the home and walked with her in his arms along the ocean shore. As she woke up during this walk, Alicia looked at Aaron and asked who he was. Aaron explained that he was a friend of her father's and that he was taking her back home. However, this statement was only partially true. While he did know her father, Aaron had no intentions of taking the girl home. Instead, he carried her to an abandoned hotel, carried out his disgusting act of violence, claimed her life, then began to clean the crime scene. Aaron began by throwing his clothes into the ocean. Then he went home to take a shower. He would later return to the scene of the murder to pick up his phone that he'd left behind by mistake, then carried on with his life as if nothing ever even happened.
By 6 a.m. the next morning, Alicia's grandfather woke up and began getting ready for work. He went to Alicia's room first thing, but he found that she wasn't in her bed. She had never run away before, but after searching the home, there was no sign of her. He woke up Alicia's grandmother, but she couldn't find her either. With nowhere else to turn, the couple called the police for help. The family made various posts online, asking for anyone and everyone in the local community to help search for Alicia. Around 9 a.m., Tony McLaughlin noticed the missed calls that she'd received from Aaron and tried to call him back. He didn't answer, but he responded by text and said, sorry, doesn't matter. When Tony revealed that Alicia was missing, Aaron responded by saying, quote, I'm sure she didn't go too far. The Coast Guard headed off the search, seeing as how the family's home was located mere steps away from the ocean. At around 7 a.m. on the nearby beach, investigators found the kitchen knife that Aaron had taken with him the evening before. Just before 9 a.m. that day, police were alerted to Alicia's body, which had been found in the nearby woods by a local who had volunteered in the search. Now, I'm not going to go any further than saying that the state of her body was repulsive. Whoever had done this to her had clearly suffered from serious mental instability. Police opened a murder investigation immediately, and thankfully, it wouldn't take them long to put the pieces together and find their killer. Police in Scotland conducted a world-class investigation. They closed off large portions of the Isle of Bute while they conducted their investigation and made a point to visit every single house in the local area and question the residents in person. During this investigation, Jeanette Campbell, Aaron's mother, helped the officers as best she could. She even volunteered to help in the search for Alicia in the few hours that she had been missing. When she returned home, she looked over the CCTV footage that she had captured outside of her home and noticed that Aaron had left the home twice on the evening that Alicia had been murdered. She asked Aaron what he'd been doing that evening, but he insisted he didn't have anything to do with the crime. His mother still decided to turn the footage into the police, mostly to help clear herself and her son of any involvement. However, her help would actually do the polar opposite, and police now had reason to believe that Aaron had no alibi for the evening of the murder. He opened up to police and admitted that he'd left his home that night to buy drugs, but there was no one who could corroborate this story. Worse yet, the CCTV footage captured Aaron on camera with the kitchen knife that would ultimately be used to claim Alicia's life. Now, I couldn't personally see the knife in the footage, but several articles pointed out that he was clearly seen carrying the knife, so I'll just take their word for it. But by July 4th, two days after the murder, Aaron was arrested under suspicion of murder and was taken to the station for questioning. From this point forward, he refused to cooperate with officers and answered no comment to all of their questions. In court, the prosecution team pointed out that additional CCTV footage was pulled from the beach around 2.25 a.m. on the morning of the murder. In this footage, a vague outline of a person can be seen and they appear to be holding something or someone. According to the evidence gathered from the dump site, Alicia's feet were clear of any cuts and scrapes, suggesting that she'd been carried that evening just as the CCTV footage suggested. In the end, Jeanette Campbell was called in to identify several items of clothing that had been found on the beach the morning after the murder. Officers managed to find a fleece jacket, a pair of shorts, a t-shirt, and a kitchen knife. And Jeanette positively identified all of these items as belonging to either herself or her son. A forensic analysis was conducted on all of the evidence that police discovered, and they were able to positively identify Aaron Campbell as the murderer. In fact, the day before his arrest, a cyber crime expert told police that he'd noticed that Aaron had searched how police find DNA online and visited a website called Collecting DNA Evidence. To top this off, Aaron was caught posting a video to Snapchat the day that the search and rescue operation was underway, with the video being titled, Found the Guy Who Has Done It. During the trial, Aaron reportedly appeared strikingly composed and unfazed by the crimes that were laid before him. When asked if he committed the murder, he stated, absolutely not, I could never do that. He also stated that pitting the crime on an innocent person would be, in his words, evil. He also claimed that he didn't have the strength to lift the girl, let alone carry her down a beach. 
Alicia weighed around 50 pounds when she was last seen. And the prosecuting investigators would soon get confirmation that Aaron was known to regularly lift over 110 pounds during his visits to the gym. The courts ultimately and obviously found Aaron guilty. But before his sentence could be read before the court, Aaron, in a shocking twist, admitted to the crime. He spoke with a psychologist who revealed that Aaron had been, quote, quite satisfied with the murder and admitted that it took everything that he had not to laugh during certain segments of the trial. The psychologist's report detailed the severity of Aaron's troubled mind, explaining that, very similar to Ted Bundy, Aaron had explicit fantasies about murdering people and having his way with their bodies afterward. In the end, the judge labeled Aaron as a cold, calculating, remorseless, and dangerous individual completely lacking in victim empathy. The judge would hand down a life sentence with a minimum of 27 years served before he'd be eligible for parole. The judge reiterated that the sentence that he handed down would have been higher if Aaron had been an adult. He concluded by saying that reintegration or rehabilitation are remote possibilities, but that they're more likely impossible for Aaron. And I agree. As it stands, Aaron's sentence was ultimately reduced from a minimum of 27 years to a minimum of 24, meaning that he'll be eligible for parole when he's 40. But for any of you who may feel the same way I do, feeling like simply locking Aaron up isn't enough punishment, well, justice comes in a variety of ways. In the summer of 2022, Aaron was rushed to the hospital after an inmate reportedly beat him within seconds of his life. The man who initiated the attack is now being labeled as a hero within the prison walls, with one source saying that everyone in the prison, including the guards and the warden, are happy that the attack took place. It's been reported that Aaron is usually kept in an isolated area of the prison because all of the other inmates want to make sure he suffers. The guards say that he was rushed to the ER when they found that his tooth was sticking through his lip. When Alicia's grandfather heard about the attack, he was pleased and said, quote, I hope he's in pain. I hope he's suffering. The only thing I'm not sorry about is that I didn't get to do it myself. With that, we've reached the end of today's story. Don't forget, if you want to see more true crime stories, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. If you'd like to help out with the operating costs of the channel, you can also hit the blue join button below this video, but that's entirely optional. With that said, my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.